Hello. 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 Hello.
we'll have a moment of quiet to examine our hearts and our consciences and then we'll say the confession together. The words will be on the screen, do join with me. We pray together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour, in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. May God, who loved the world so much that he sent his Son to be our Saviour, forgive us our sins and make us holy to serve him in the world, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now we have our Bible readings. There are two, firstly from the seventh chapter of Romans, beginning at verse 15. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am! Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself, in my mind, am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. And our Gospel reading is from Matthew chapter 11, beginning at verse 25. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Heavenly Father, pour your spirit into all that I may say this morning and touch our hearts in the way that you know we need to be touched. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Early on Friday morning, I dropped my eldest, Jessie, her husband, Mark, and their two-year-old son, Luca, also known as Luca Bear, Luca Buca, or Senor Bookington, to Heathrow Airport. I'd flown out to Cambodia to visit them on June the 1st. Jessie, Luca and I flew back here together 10 days later. Mm. 26 hours 
travelling with a two-year-old. I'd forgotten. And then Mark joined us later. But over the six weeks we were together on and off, between their visiting other family members and my work schedule, as with pretty much everyone else who met Luca Bear, I was mesmerised by his wonder at the world. And I cried on the way home for the loss of that daily reminder of wonder, for not hearing, oh wow, coming out of the mouth of a two-year-old gazing at a snail in the garden, or at a plane flying overhead through the kitchen window in the sky above Poplar Road. Or most importantly, oh wow, at anything with wheels. Pram, car, taxi, scooter, toy tractor, mobility scooter. Sitting in the driver's seat of my car, pretending to drive on the return from some excursion, was the highlight of the day for Luca, no matter how fabulous that excursion may have been. I was working away, and on my arrival home, Luca trundled down the stairs, ran down the hallway towards me, shouting, Nana, followed by car, as he ran straight past me towards the front door, wanting to go out and sit in the driver's seat of my car. Sit, car, Nana, oh wow. Mm, I know my place. So far, so proud Nana. But the point being, the wonder. Luca reminded me every day that I was with him of that unique wonder to be found in God's creation. The wonder that can light up, infuse and enrich our lives at any and every moment of the day. In his letter to the church at Rome, Paul reflects on a life as a follower of Christ lived by the rules that can crumble on first contact with the world because following the rules without the infusion of the wonder leaves the actions of our lives hollow, performed, not experienced. Rule following without the solid infilling of spirit. Just now we have the passage from Romans, followed by the gospel reading from Matthew. Question. Why do we read Romans first and then Matthew when our series is on Romans? Surely it would make more sense to hear the passage being preached on just before you hear the sermon. So it's fresh in your mind, Matthew and then Romans. So why do we read the scriptures in the reverse order? And why, for that matter, do we stand for the gospel reading, but not for the other scripture reading? Rules. It's the rules. But without the understanding of the spirit, the why of the rules, the following is hollow. It is not enriched with meaning and can be knocked over or changed at any moment. So, we stand in particular for our gospel reading to mark the difference in the origin of the passages and how we are to think of them. The word gospel is derived from the Anglo-Saxon term God spell, meaning good story, which in turn is a version of the Latin Evangelium, good news, which in turn comes from the Greek euangelion, euangelion, you, good, angelion, message, from which we get angel, messenger. So, the gospel, the good message. The gospel contains the direct words and actions of God on earth, made flesh in Jesus Christ. Standing for the reading or the hearing of the Holy Gospel is an ancient tradition handed down to us from the Didascalia. The Didascalia, which is a foundational Christian document, is thought to have been composed around 230 AD, 230 AD, probably by a bishop of northern Syria, possibly near Antioch. The Didascalia says that according to tradition, the apostles themselves had already laid down the rule that, at the conclusion of the scriptures, the gospel shall be read as being the seal of all scriptures, and let the people listen to it, standing upon their feet, because it is good tidings of the redemption of all men. And so, 
we continue to stand to hear the good message from Jesus. And so when listening to several passages from the Bible, we read Jesus' good message last to seal in our hearts and minds all that we have heard from the scriptures. Jesus is the final word, the tin lid on it. And so with the scriptures, so too with the rules, the commandments, the law, as Paul puts it in Romans, that we follow. Jesus is the final word. We follow rules all the time in life, and as Christians in faith, we follow rules. We follow the rules of practice, as in the standing, the sitting, the kneeling, the collective singing, the praying, the who can do what, when and how. And then we follow the rules of teaching that we read in scripture. In Exodus, there are the, in Exodus, there are the foundational rules of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Commandment one. Why? God wants what is best for us. If we put something else ahead of him in our life, it's harder for God to bless us and us to see him. The second commandment, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Anything we worship more than God is a graven image. Cars, clothes, material goods, relationships, social standing, work, ambition, all fleeting, all impermanent, meaningless in comparison with our eternal creator. The third commandment, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. This can mean using God's name as a swear word or professing our Christian faith, but not living or acting it out in a way that reflects Jesus in us. The fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Sunday or the Sabbath day is a day to ring fence as best we can for worship in communion or alone, reflecting on, learning more about, and celebrating our faith, our relationship with God, and our place in the world as Christians. The fifth commandment, honour thy father and thy mother. This might look different for everyone, but we are commanded to love and care and respect those who cared for us first. The sixth commandment, thou shalt not kill. A simple but complex rule to live out. What if you're a member of the armed forces, for example? The seventh commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. If we marry, if we commit to another, the commitments we make are sacred and breaking them causes deep unhappiness. The Eighth Commandment, Thou shalt not steal. The Ninth Commandment, Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbour. If we steal, if we lie or bear false witness against another, we sacrifice truth and honesty, and in doing so, we sacrifice our peace of mind and a clear communication with God. The Last Commandment, the Tenth Commandment, Thou shalt not covet. To covet, to be so jealous of or obsessed with something someone else has, their life, their stuff, their people, blocks our sight of God. The logic of these commandments is clear in intention. Our path to God needs to be free and unimpeded. Our eyes on the prize of life lived with him. Then, with the arrival of Jesus, we are given the superseding commandments, as we hear in chapter 12 of Mark's Gospel from Jesus himself. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, Of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. 
Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbour as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Paul takes time in his letter to the early Roman church to reflect on the following of rules, of commandments. Paul describes the challenge of living in a whole way, following the rules, the law is laid down in the commandments, because you can give a good impression of being a faithful person. You can be a stickler, as he was, and follow the rules, and believe that in keeping the laws you are living a godly life. Yes, we follow the rules, but Paul wants us to get into the understanding so that the developing church at Rome has a solid foundation on which to flourish in faith, and so to flourish in the wonder and the abundance of God's creation, and share that good message with the sure footing of Christ's inspiration. Otherwise, the rule following is just the outline of the drawing without the colouring in. It's the what without the why. It's the where without the way. Jesus tells us he is the way. We follow him. Our fuel is the grace and articulation and manifestation of his love, not just the application of the rules. In the rolling out of the commandments, when I reflect on them, the law of the Ten Commandments, and then the new commandments of Jesus, I am struck by the addition of that one word, love. The word love is not in the Ten Commandments. It is all the way through Jesus' two greatest commandments. But watch out. Alternatively, you can believe that in following Jesus, the grace of God, the ability of forgiveness for our shortcomings, the availability of our... You can believe that in following Jesus, the grace of God, the availability of forgiveness for our shortcomings, these things mean we can fall short of the behaviour of the commandments, but it's okay because by grace you can receive endless forgiveness. So no need to worry about those shortcomings or truly address the behaviour in our lives that lies behind them. Paul explains to the church at Rome, through his own experience, that without the ballast of Christ's gracious love, when exposed to the challenges of the world, the outwardly well-behaved obedience of his life, the strictness of keeping the rules, were not enough to stop his faith from buckling, nor will they be enough to stop our faith from buckling. We need both. Yes, we follow the rules, but Paul wants us to get to a place of holistic understanding. At the time of writing, Paul wanted the developing church at Rome to have a solid foundation on which to flourish in faith, and so to flourish in the wonder and the abundance of God's creation, and to share that good message with the sure footing of Christ's inspiration. So too for us today, here in the parish of Herne Hill and beyond. We need both. The outline of the drawing, coloured in. The what with the why, the where with the way, the way that is Jesus Christ. Understanding the spirit of the law is to understand that the point of the law is not to just keep its rules. It is to understand that the rules for living become imbued with the creative spirit of an abundant life through the love Jesus commands we give to God, ourselves and the world. To be obedient to Jesus' command to love and to follow the rules in that spirit frees us to live and flourish as we were created to do. Paul takes up this theme again when writing to the church at Corinth, as we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. He writes, If I speak in the tongues of men, or of angels, but do not have love, 
I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. I was polishing up some wood yesterday, a piece of walnut wood. It's a good solid piece of wood, but it looked pretty dull and unremarkable without the polish. But when polished up, the grain the colours shone through, the wonder of the wood, the oh wow of it. I could really see the beauty in its infinite detail of God's creation in that wood. We need to be more than the solid, dull piece of wood. We need to be more than the clanging symbol. We need to be the something we, each one of us, are created by God to be. We need to let Jesus polish up our lives, infill us with his love, his challenge, his grace, so that our faith will not crumble, even in the hardest of moments, so that our rule following is meaningful, sure-footed, and lived out with the purpose of the good message to be shared in all that we are, the salt that gives flavour to life, the yeast that helps life rise, the hand that uplifts, the foot that walks alongside, the wonder that infuses our hearts, our church family, our community, our world, the love of Jesus. Tomorrow, our dear sister, Miss Annette will be laid to rest. In the challenges of family life, Miss Annette infused the love of God into my family, into our lives, my children's, my husband's, my mother's, mine. I thank Jesus for the life of her, for the oh wow of Annette Lewis in our church family and beyond. Faith in action. May we continue to infuse the foundational love of our faith in the world around us. I pray that the ballast of Christ's love may infill our obedience to his commandments so that our faith is unshakable, that it may release us into the freedom from all that is not of God at play in our lives what we call the sin, the shortcomings, the doubts, the fears, the falling away. May we hold God's wonder close so that we can share it, our sword and shield, the shield to protect us through all that life may throw at us or draw us into, and the sword so that we may battle courageously forward into the life God wants for us. Jesus says, as we heard in our gospel reading this morning, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. May we take up Jesus's invitation wholeheartedly and return to the wonder, the oh wow, of who we are as God created and blessed us to be, so that the glory of our unique grain, loved and paid attention to, can shine with the holy beauty we were born to manifest. May we rest and shine and be a blessing in Jesus this day and evermore. Amen.
And now our prayers for others. Let's pray. Our loving God is here, attentive to his children. Let us pray to him now. Father, we pray that your church may always be open to receive your love. Keep us swept clear of pomposity, complacency or self-righteousness. Let us come humbly and simply into your presence and wait on you, knowing our dependence on you and rejoicing in it. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we pray for all world leaders and their governments, for the strength of authority comes not through force and domination, but through cooperation and mutual respect. We pray for greater consideration of the needs of one another and of our planet, and a desire to right past wrongs and injustices. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we pray for a growing maturity in our thinking and our loving that enables us to be childlike. We pray for healing from all the damage that prevents us from growing up. We pray that our children in this church may be helped to grow strong and we thank you for all we learn from them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we pray for all who cry out for rest and relief, all who are carrying terrible burdens that weigh them down, all whose poverty denies them the chance of healing, and all whose wealth denies them the chance of knowing their need of you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we pray for those who die unprepared to meet you, for all those who have died recently, both those well known to us and those dying unknown and unnoticed all over the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we thank you for your gentleness and humility, which puts our pride and vanity to shame. Teach us to trust more and more in your truth, discarding what the world considers essential and rejoicing in your freedom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we finish our prayers with the words of the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Our final song sets us up for the days ahead. My hope is built on nothing less about Christ, my cornerstone. Let's sing.
when he shall come with trumpet sound. Oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone. For blessed I stand before the throne. For blessed I stand before the throne. service together I'd encourage you to go to our parish website which has got details of all the things that are going on in the parish and things that are coming up and so we end our time together with a blessing may the love of the Lord Jesus draw you to himself the power of the Lord Jesus strengthen you in his service and the joy of the Lord Jesus fill your hearts and the blessing of God Almighty the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you and all those you love now and forever. Amen. Bye-bye.